anybody who's been to South Asia cannot have failed to notice what a rich and saturated oral world uh, it is. You are constantly bombarded with um, uh, sounds, with uh, bits of music, um, calls for prayers, temple bells and, and songs and so on. And performance traditions of word, song and music um, have sort of been pervasive in South Asia for a, for a very long time, um, occupying a whole range uh, of spaces from poetic um, meetings uh, to street festivals to gatherings in Sufi shrines, uh, temple festivals um, and so on. Now, methodologically, uh, contemporary performance practices have tended to be to, to be studied by either ethnomusicologists or um, anthropologists and ethnographers who um, are aware that uh, the contemporary performances have a history but don't, um, don't go into them. And conversely, uh, scholars of texts uh, like myself typically gesture towards the fact that the tales and songs that we work with were um, meant to be recited but don't go any further. So telling and text um, as a volume um, tries to really bridge this gap and uh, ask questions um, relating to the connection and the relationship and the uses of books and texts to performance and uh, the life of music, uh, performance and other genres, uh, storytelling, preaching and so on in uh, the cultural world of uh, North India. The essays try to address and answer a, a number of um, really quite significant questions. Uh, the first, in fact, has to do with uh, the relationship between uh, performers and performances and books. Um, what is the relationship of, for example, musical treatises or songbooks to actual musical performances? What was the relationship of performers to books that seem to be um, aids uh, or, or guides to performance? Um, what was the relationship of the written tales that we have to um, their performance? Another question related to aesthetics. How was a common aesthetics, uh, particularly around um, music, uh, North Indian music, what we call Hindustani nowadays, created out of two quite different um, philosophical traditions, in Sanskrit and Persian? Another one uh, related to the embodied knowledge and the social position of performance. So, for example, we know that musicians and other performers tend to be considered quite low in the social hierarchy. But, and yet, in the liminal space of performance, they appear as having, in fact, quite a lot of power over, thanks to their ability and the power of their music or their storytelling uh, over the patrons who are often um, their social superiors. So we, one of the questions we, we asked was how do uh, musicians and performers manage to negotiate the social relations and display uh, power in, uh, in their performances? Tellings and Text also seeks to, to map and see the connection between the different spaces uh, of performance. We know that uh, poetry, uh, music and storytelling was cultivated in you know, Sufi hospices, uh, among devotional groups, um, at Im imperial or regional courts, in the houses of uh, noblemen and merchant. And in all cases, we have questions of um, access, of connoisseurship, um, of evaluation, and, and really all the, all the essays try to be... Um, conscious and, and address uh, these questions uh, as far as we can. And I think together they provide a really um, rich map um, of the world of uh, music, storytelling and performance in India and the, its interconnections. The volume started out as a conference uh, that was part of a project funded by HRC that I led at SOAS uh, between 2006 and 2009 called um, How to do Multilingual Literary History in the Context of Early Modern North India. 
And the project tried to take multilingualism seriously as a condition of North Indian society and, and literary culture in a way that, in a sense, was done only very um, sort of superficially before. And even when the archives that we have at our disposal are often monolingual, and so they, they sort of leave this multilingualism out. The project brought together a group of senior and junior scholars over three years. Um, and by the time we came to Tellings and Text, it was a third year. And so it was quite a, quite a sort of well cohesive, uh, a good cohesive group. We were familiar with each other and we were open to um, setting the materials um, that we knew within this kind of composite, broader uh, multilingual picture. Catherine Schofield, who's work on Persian text on Hindustani music and the cultivation of uh, North Indian music by uh, and aesthetics by Mughal noblemen has been so um, path-breaking, was crucial um, crucial part of the project from the very beginning. And so it was ideal for me to be able to edit this book from her. And she's also a very elegant writer, so the tone of the introduction has um, improved considerably uh, with her help. Conferences are always very important to a field, particularly to a new field like um, like ours of uh, South Asian multilingual literary history and literary cultures. Um, but conference volumes are of often unwieldy beasts and they tend to gather dust on library shelves. And they also are usually quite expensive, particularly when one wants only to read one or two essays. So the idea to publish with a um, um, publisher like Open Books, uh, who provides um, cheap or even uh, free PDF uh, versions um, on demand um, all over the world, was a very attractive one. And we are very grateful to King's College London for providing a publication subvention even after the project was finished, and to David Lan and our copy editors at Open Books for doing such a such a thorough job because with almost 20 um, essays dealing with a number of languages and three scripts with no standardized transliteration this was a really uh, difficult book to um, to edit and get right um, i'm sure we'll find typos but i hope that you like the finished product